Fission products are nuclides that are created as a result of another nuclide fissioning. There are almost always two fission fragments created, not counting the neutrons, protons, alpha particles, etc., that may also be created when an atom fissions. Which fission products exist are as a result of an experimentally determined probability distribution, PJI, for the ith nuclide. Here we see the probability distribution that a fission product is created with an atomic mass A. These probability distributions are different depending on which nuclide is fissioning. As seen here, the uranium-235 curve is very different from the plutonium-239 curve. Moreover, at the lower atomic masses, we end up with one fission product that is lighter than a heavier fission product, which is why this probability distribution is bimodal. Fission products tend to be very radioactive. Because they cannot fission via neutrons, they are poisons in the core. Some of them are very strong poisons that significantly impact the reactivity. The time rate of change of the fission products can be determined by considering only fission cross-sections in the transmutation equation. For a given fission product little i, the time derivative of the concentration of I is equal to the sum over all from nuclides of the from nuclides concentration times the probability that a nuclide will fission from J to I times the, cross -section, the fission cross section of J times the flux plus the, the concentration of J times the branch ratio J to I times the decay constant. All of this is subtracted by the losses in I, which are Ni sigma A I phi minus Ni lambda I. For purposes here, let's ignore spontaneous fission, which has a low likelihood in a reactor, proton decay as hydrogen 1 creation, and let's also not count alpha decay as helium 4 creation. Therefore, the branch ratio gamma J to I is zero. Thus, we can simplify the previous equation by dropping the second term on the right-hand side. Moreover, once a fission product is created, it can only turn into other fission products. Let's now look at a couple of case studies. The, for the first case study, we'll look at samarium-149. Samarium-149 has a huge thermal absorption cross-section, where sigma A is approximately 4 times 10 to the 4 barns. Here we see the transmutation chain for samarium-149. Initially, a higher order species will fission, creating neodymium-149. This will decay by beta minus decay with a half-life of 1.7 hours into promethium-149 which will in turn also beta minus decay with a half-life of 53 hours to samarium-149. Samarium-149 is destroyed by neutron capture, creating samarium-150, which is relatively inert. Because the half-life of neodymium-149 is much, much less than the half-life of promethium-149, these two species are what we call in secular equilibrium. Therefore, it's a reasonable approximation to model fission events as directly producing promethium-149 rather than producing neodymium-149. Call P the number density of promethium-149 and S the number density of samarium-149. The time rate of change of P is equal to the probability that neodymium-149 is produced from fission times the macroscopic fission cross-section times the flux minus the probability of decay, lambda p times p. Then the samarium-149 time rate of change of its concentration is equal to the source of the p decays minus the probability that a neutron is absorbed by the samarium-149. Here we see a sample reactor scenario, where initially samarium-149 is bred in. After shutdown, decays from promethium-149 are no longer uh, restricted because there is no flux. So the samarium-149 increases to a certain 
liminal point. After we restart the reactor, there's neutron, there are neutrons added back in, which eat up the samarium-149 until finally more is bred in. For our second case study, let's examine the neutron poison xenon-135. This has an even la larger absorption cross-section, approximately 2.6 million barns. Here we see the transmutation chain for xenon-135. Fission can create either telenium-135 or xenon-135 directly. A series of beta decays then occur very quickly, leading to xenon-135. Xenon-135 may either beta minus decay or undergo neutron capture, creating xenon-136. Let's denote I as the number density of iodine-135 and X as the number density of xenon-135. We see this very similar set of differential equations for the iodine and xenon concentrations. Solving for xenon-135, we can see the following behavior. After start startup, an initial concentration of xenon-135 breeds in and then starts to plateau. Immediately after shutdown, which is when the neutrons stop eating the xenon-135 that's present, we see a huge spike in the number of xenon-135 coming from I coming from iodine-135 decay until the xenon-135 itself decays. This effectively present, prevents nuclear reactors from starting up again immediately after they shut down. 